Welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast by Third Wave. Today, I am speaking with Alex Atwood, the CEO and founder of Gravy Work and also a transformational and leadership coach. Everything in my life at this point, Paul, is somehow involved in the transformational space. My focus now is to meet people where they're at that haven't found this work. And whether it's psychedelics, whether it's breath work, whether it's programs like Landmark, really just give as much access to that insight uh, as I possibly can. And I think what's important is allow for the space for those that that see this as being something that could be transformational, impactful in their lives, allow that space for that to show up. Hey folks, welcome back to the podcast. Today we have Alex Atwood. Alex is someone that I first met on an ayahuasca retreat, a One Heart Journeys ayahuasca retreat, New Year's 2018, 2019. Uh, We ended up spending a lot of time together on that retreat and hanging out a few other times outside of that. And then a couple of years ago, Alex called me. We had just rolled out our CCP coaching certification program for Third Wave. And he's like, Paul, I see a really big vision here and I want to be part of it. So he enrolled in our inaugural coaching program, became a certified Third Wave coach, Uh, But Alex has many hats and has held many roles, including as a podcaster, a public speaker, an angel investor. More than anything, he is an entrepreneur and a very successful entrepreneur. He has also been involved as a coach for Landmark. So we talk a lot about Landmark in this episode and sort of the pros and cons of Landmark, the differences between Landmark and psychedelic work. And overall, Alex is just a genuine human. He has a huge heart And it really was an honor to be able to sit down and record with him today, talking about meditation, talking about Landmark, talking about Third Wave's coaching certification program, talking about his sort of process and journey of finding meaning and fulfillment in his career. Uh, This is just a really beautiful sort of deep dive into Alex Atwood and who he is uh, as a human being. Alex Atwood is a multifaceted, purpose-driven leader with more than 20 years of experience as a serial entrepreneur. He has helmed four startups in the hospitality and staffing space, and he is also a coach in the emerging psychedelic field with a particular focus on optimizing human potential. His other roles include podcaster, public speaker, angel investor, all in firms that help to build a better world. And he's also a philanthropist with a soft spot for owners and operators of family businesses. Alex is also working towards an ICF certification and organizational well-being, has been a coach for Landmark Worldwide, and an elevation leader for the One Heart program. In addition, Alex has led workshops on integrity and self-actualization with the goal of helping attendees realize their own potential and have greater self-esteem, fulfillment, creativity, and productivity. All right, that's it for now. Let's go ahead and dive into this episode with Alex Atwood. I hope you enjoy our conversation together. Hey, listeners, welcome back to the Psychedelic Podcast. Today, we have a dear friend of mine on the show, Alex Atwood. Alex and I met at an ayahuasca retreat um, almost more than four years ago now. And then a couple of years ago, when we launched our uh, training program for coaches, Alex hit me up and was like, Paul, I think I, think I might want to do this. And uh, And so I thought, you know, he interviewed me his for his, for his podcast, The Alchemist Lounge, a couple months ago. I wanted to bring him in to talk about his experience as a founder, how plant, how plant medicine helped him through uh, some challenges and difficulties, and what's on the horizon for him as an entrepreneur, as a coach, and as a leader. So, Alex, it's great to to be able to sit down and record a conversation with you. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited. So, tell. As, as a starting point, tell me a little bit, tell our audience a little bit about your experience with ayahuasca at the One Heart Retreat that we were on together. Why? What brought you to ayahuasca? What was your experience of that retreat? What maybe shifted and changed for you as a result of, of working with that medicine? Yeah. So um, finding ayahuasca uh, was something that um, had come through a mutual friend of ours who was one of the founders of One Heart. Um, His name's Barry Stamos. And um, he was someone, so I had actually met Barry, of all places, in in Beverly Hills uh, in the mid-2000s at at someone who was founding a startup at the time. 
and uh, and it was the most probably the, one of the most vapid places you could be in terms of spirituality. I mean, there was a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of showing of what it is that uh, you uh, do for work. There was a lot of glam, a lot of glitz. Um, there was uh, like hand rolled sushi happening there. It was a massive house. It was, it was everything you could, you know, picture at a um, at a mid two thousand era startup, uh, you know, event, right? Um, and I got into a conversation with uh, with Barry, who at the time had just exited his startup, and so he was in a he was in an interesting sort of egoic mood, and we were we were there, and we started to connect. And talk about various things. And one of the things that um, he mentioned to me was was uh, was the that he was he was he just come from like this this mushroom journey on the beach, and um, and so we sort of connected around around mushrooms. Now at the time, my understanding with with psychedelics or mushrooms was was very um, was very much related to the experimentation that I had done in college, and um, and you know without really any intention at all. Um, and it was just, it was a connector. It was something that we found that was like interesting between us both. And, and so we just sort of built that bond. And so Barry and I remained friends from that point moving forward. And, um, and it was very interesting because I had connected with him maybe three or four months prior to being invited on the journey. And he had mentioned to me that they were having, you know, he, he had just sort of found ayahuasca, a good friend of his had, 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 uh, had joined a ceremony in New York, and now he had launched this new company uh, that would take founders and take you know type A personalities and introduce them to ayahuasca. And had it not been Barry, I probably wouldn't have taken part in the ceremony because to me, what I had heard at the time, and between 2018 and 2023, there's been a lot more information in the public sphere around psychedelics, specifically ayahuasca. But in early 2018, it was something that I had heard of. I, you know, it was a, it was, it was uh, explained to me as the most powerful psychedelic in the world, and it was something that would knock my socks off. It was very difficult. I mean, there was most of the, most of what I had heard around ayahuasca. Like warning, was, um, warning, 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 warning. Yeah, yeah challenge, yeah. challenge. Like you yeah. know, there's going to be issues. Now, I came from like I was born in 1974. So um, I started to come into awareness in the mid '80s when the war on drugs was as heavy as it could possibly be, and there was all sorts of, um, uh, I guess I call it um, uh, indoctrination with children around, specifically acid. That was that was sort of what scared me most, right? And so my my idea of psychedelics, especially something as powerful and labeled as being the most powerful psychedelic in the world was was scary. But I spoke with Barry about it and I felt comfortable with him as as a human being. And I felt like, okay, if I'm very curious about this, um, and if I'm going to take part in this, I'm going to want to be with, you know, someone that I feel very comfortable with, someone that I feel like has a very happy and and loving spirit. And I always felt that way about Barry. But, you know, a couple of years before that, I had taken part in something called the Landmark Forum, which which is a weekend um, that involves no plant medicine, involves mainly conversation. Some a lot of NLP sort of methodology is sort of woven into it. But I had already done that a few years back, so I was in the space of transformation, and I related to what Barry was telling me less around what you know, sort of the fear that I had, or the you know the the relatedness that I had around maybe it being sort of a fun thing. And I looked at it as more transformational. So I agreed to go. <clears throat> I remember it was August of 2018. He called me, we had a conversation. Immediately I said, I'll go. I just committed to it. Um, and as I got closer to it, I, I, I just became more and more fearful of it, right? I said, what did I just agree to? I'm going to go out into the mountains of Costa Rica with only one guy that I know, know in this group. And I'm going to drink this this potion of some sort, and um, I don't know what's going to happen to me. So, of course, all of these, all of these things started rolling around in my head. I started listening to all sorts of podcasts because the only real information I could find at the time around this was either on the Tim Ferriss podcast or the Joe Rogan podcast. 
So I was listening and hearing about all of the different transformational experiences. And there was a thread that, you know, this is something that will change your life. So I held on to that and sort of let go of, of the fear. So when I, w- when I actually arrived at the retreat and I met you and I met some of the other people that were there, I felt so comfortable just around people that had come from the same journey that I had and that were in the same mindset that I was in. So immediately in that space around those people, I felt comfortable. I felt like, hey, these people are from, you know, essentially like the same, they're walking the same path that I am. There was, there were founders there. There were people that were, you know, that I could really relate to. And everyone was, even the ones who had, who had, who had drank the ayahuasca, they were all, they all sort of had the fear, but the excitement at the same time. So I, when, when I entered, I immediately felt comfortable. And I think that's an important part of, you know, those who are looking to, to do plant medicine work that you feel very comfortable, um, with the facilitators, with the group that you're with. Um, and, and so that was a big part. So, so going into, you know, going into the, the journey, I felt comfortable. I had the people that I felt like were, um, I felt like would be able to relate to me. And it was the most powerful experience of my life. I mean, it really was. I, um, it's really hard to describe in words, <clears throat> but um, my, after my first ceremony, which was extremely difficult, um, the, the way the process works is you, you immediately go the following night into another ceremony. So I went into ceremony one with lots of fear and it, it, was, it wasn't a pleasant experience, but it was a powerful, almost unexplainable experience. The next night, which happened to be New Year's Eve of 2018, um, was a, I guess you can call it a cathartic experience. But what really, um, what really sort of impacted me was not just the journey itself and the music and everything and, and the sounds, but the conversations that happened after the journey when, when what you experienced suddenly came through someone else's voice around their experience. And I didn't, you know, until that happened, Paul, I didn't really believe in magic or, you know, I, I, I said, well, you know, there's, there's coincidences in life. I was very skeptical, but you know, after my first ayahuasca experience, I immediately saw that no, the, you know, magic is, is really, you know, here in the world every day is, is a gift. And, um, and, and things happened in ceremony that were, you know, that, I mean, I remember wanting to like being in a, in a position where I wanted to, to vomit, which happens quite a bit. They call it purging. And, um, the person next to me purged for me. I mean, I, I was, <laughs> I wanted to purge and I was so connected to the person sitting next to me in ceremony that he actually started purging. And I felt myself like letting go of whatever it is that was in me. And that sort of connectedness I'd never felt before with another human being. Um, so it was just extremely powerful. And, and so coming out of that ceremony, having those conversations, building these lifelong relationships um, was something that t- didn't just translate to me spiritually, but translated sort of throughout my life. I mean, it, 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 it had me relate to nature differently. It had me relate to my business, my organization. Uh, everything sort of changed. And it really, to me, it was a culmination of the work that had started in uh, Landmark, the transformational space, combined with um, the meditation that I had learned in 2009, but really didn't practice too much. But that sort was of- that TM, Transcendental Meditation? Yeah, Transcendental it? Meditation, yeah. yeah. Um, which, which was something that kind of showed, in, showed up in and out of my life. And after, after the One Heart journey in 2018, the ayahuasca journey, um, I started to have a different um, uh, started to have a different take on meditation. So it really did shift everything in my life. And it was, a uh, it was probably one of the biggest things that had happened to me. I mean, it may even be why we're sitting here today having this conversation. <laughs> yeah. You know, having that experience <laughs> then obviously we had a chance to personally connect, but also just, yeah. I imagine your curiosity and interest in psychedelics yeah. and how 
you know, beneficial and useful they could be grew enormously after, after having those experiences. Yeah. I mean, I found it as being, um, one of the most powerful agents of change that anyone could ever experience in their lives. I found it to be something that, um, absolutely like shifts the trajectory of your, your thoughts, your spirit, you know, the door, sometimes the direction that you're going in. Um, so, so following that journey, I was, I was a huge proponent. Um, but I also realized that, um, like this wasn't something that necessarily, uh, could be heard by everybody in my, you know, in, in my immediate circle. So well, initially so I, yeah. Oh, let's go into that a little bit because bring us a little bit deeper into who you were at that point in time, who, who was in your circle professionally? Yeah. What were you up to kind of yeah. like, yeah, like, yeah, tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. So at the time I had run, I, I was an entrepreneur. I had, um, two businesses. I had one that I had been running for about 15 years. Um, I had another training business that I had been running for, for some time. I, I, I grew up in the Washington DC area, um, which is a very conservative sort of area. I, I wouldn't call it like not necessarily politically conservative, but just in general, like acceptance of, um, things like psychedelics or modalities like that. It's very transactional, I should say in the DC area. Right. So I was a very transactional person. Um, I was transactional in the sense that, um, you know, I found success in business to be a gauge of sort of overall success in life. And, you know, my, I guess my, my guiding light at the time, I, I would tell people, oh, it's my family, you know, it's, 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 it's my friends, it's my business. But really it was, it was really driven by an egoic sort of sense of, of success, um, and it was in the background. It was the operating system is really what it was, right? So my operating system was based in ego. My words and what I was actually um, you know, speaking around were not necessarily authentic. I think that's the biggest disconnect. I was extremely, uh, even though I didn't realize, I was extremely inauthentic. And I was living a life where I was sort of identifying myself as a founder as a as a father, uh, you know all of these different labels that I had given to myself, which, which honestly it added so much pressure um, in, in terms of who I am. Right? You know, you 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 try and live up to some sort of title that you give yourself, and uh, and it ends up adding you know something that isn't necessarily you. Um, so so that's where I was. But the key is I didn't realize it, right? And you know. When I came out of that ceremony, I found myself going back into those circles. Now, what were my circles? Well, I had a board of directors who, you know, had a certain, um, you know, certain way that they saw me and a certain way that I that I was around them. So I was this person around my board. I was this person around my customers, around my kids. I was, you know, this person, and so I was wearing these different sort of masks depending upon where I was. All of them were somewhat inauthentic, right? And none of them knew that I had just taken part of an ayahuasca ceremony. So I had told everyone I was going on a meditation retreat. Nobody knew. As a matter of fact, um, we had people looking to shoot uh, our, you know, our experience there. And I told, I signed off and said, I don't want it. I don't want my, my face on any cameras. I want no one to know that I was part of this. That was a big thing that I had talked to Barry about. I, you know, at the time my kids were were um, in school. They were teenagers. They were like, you know, in high school. And I was like, I'm, I'm talking to them about, you know, the dangers of drugs. And I'm in a, <laughs> and I'm in a, uh, I'm in a, a jungle in Costa Rica drinking uh, some sort of, you know, root, uh, you know, uh, concoction, which is a psychedelic. So it felt as if I was even that probably feels inauthentic then. Right. Like, Cause it's yeah, like total there's, duality, there's a, total duality. Right. Yeah. Um, and that's what was happening. And so <laughs> yeah, that's that's where I was going in the going into journey space for sure. So you mentioned landmark a couple of times, and I don't think we've ever talked about landmark on the podcast. Yeah. Um I went to like a landmark opening night when I lived in New York, invited by a friend, sort of got the lay of the land. Wasn't necessarily my thing, but I also know that for a lot of people in my life, it's been incredibly uh, impactful and beneficial. And I'd love for you to just Tell our listeners a little bit about what is Landmark and me, what I'm tracking in your story is potentially going through Landmark first, 
help to sort of knock knock at that identity, right? Start to open mm-hmm. it up. And then ayahuasca just really sort of busted it completely. So yep. what is Landmark? What happens at Landmark? Yeah. You know, why do people love it? Yeah. Just give us a little bit of insight yeah. there. Yeah. So a uh, landmark was a, was, was something I had no idea about. Um, there, there, there's a mall next to where I grew up called landmark mall. And so that I, when I thought landmark, I'm like, Oh, that's where the Macy's is. Right. Well, I was going through a very tough, uh, breakup at the time. Um, mm. it was in 2015 and it was somebody that I thought I was going to marry and, um, and mm. suddenly it was over. Um, mm. and I was just in this really, you know, I was, I was in that place where it was dark. I wasn't ready to let go. And, um, and so I was talking to a very good friend of mine and he said, um, have you ever heard of the landmark? And I said, I've never heard of that at all. He said, well, before I married my wife, her and I both took the landmark form together and, um, and we learned a way to communicate with each other that has been like the biggest, the biggest, uh, uh, like tool in our relationship that, 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 that we've used. So I looked and he, oh, and he said, look, when you Google it, ignore all of the, uh, like ignore everything that says it's a cult. <laughs> and I said, okay, I will. So I, so I typed in landmark forum and it's like cult this cult that. And, but the people that had actually gone through it, there was like, you know, they, I think they, 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 they said it's like popcorn popping. Right. So there was an article where you'd go there and everybody at some time in these. So, so what landmark is, is it's three days, uh, at least eight hours a day, sometimes 10 hours a day. You're in a room. Um, they used to not let you out of the room. So, th- so the background around Landmark, uh, it started in the late 60s. A guy named Werner Earhard started uh, the program. It's one of the first self-help, I guess you can call it, programs, transformational work programs in the, in, in the West. And what it did was it sort of formulated some of the essence of Buddhism, transcendentalism, um, uh, stoicism, and and sort of synthesized it so that it would be palatable to the West. And so you know the the language that they use, the um uh the way that they speak in the forum, the way that it's very difficult to explain, much like an ayahuasca ceremony. But what I realized was as you're in, as you're having this conversation, and what they do is they talk about things like integrity, they talk about things like self expression, they talk about all these different all these different um, topics, but they present them in a way that is that is different than how you hear them in 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 normal every day and even the way that they they speak is is very unique and and to someone who'd never done this work before anything it was just fascinating to me that you know I was in this room for 8 hours and at the end of the day I was just like I was like shot out of a cannon I remember on uh, there was a it was a Saturday and people just start becoming completely ecstatic because they something clicks there's a conversation there's something that was said all of a sudden people are on their phones calling relatives sisters brothers ex-husbands ex-wives they haven't spoken to in forever and they're crying and they're having these deep conversations and and I'm I'm calling at the time I had not talked to my mom in I had a long time and I called her and I said mom you know I love you and she started crying and I started crying so it was incredible and the girlfriend and by look I went into this Friday. I said, the only thing I wanted to get out of this is I need to get this girl out of my freaking head. I am, I cannot get this girl off my mind. I said, look, and, and I, the, every time, I, you know, everybody I talked to when we were, I said, look, I'm here because of a girl. If I, if, if, if you guys can brainwash me out of this, I don't care if this is a cult, but if you can get this out of my head, I, this will be a success. And, um, and so that's, that's basically what happened. And, and by Saturday, Sunday, I was, I was like, I was shot out of a cannon. I was so excited about life. I had a whole new perspective. I was ready to, you know, have conversations with every single person I possibly could. I called my ex. She didn't answer, but I left her a message. I'm sure I sounded manic, but it was my first experience of like transformational conversation and work. Um, And, you know, Paul, it felt like coming out of there. I had like a cheat code to life or something like I was having converse, like as I'm talking to people who aren't, who don't know, who aren't familiar with this sort of work. I was just like, wow, I, I understand things that you don't understand. And I almost got an ego out of it. I was like, whoa, now I get it. And you don't. So it was, it was almost like my conversations were like coming from a place of 
not meeting people where they're at, you know, kind of telling them, Hey, you, you know, you integrity is, you know, making promises to yourself and fulfilling them and, you know, the, all this stuff. And people weren't hearing me. They were just like, man, this guy shot out of a cannon. He's, he's got a great attitude, but, um, man, he's I enthusiastic. Don't clearly. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I think he joined a cult, <laughs> right. You know? And, um, but I didn't care. I was just so happy to be, you know, you know, having a, a different understanding of life, a different relatedness to people. And so my life changed after that weekend. It really did. And, um, I started to journal. I started to, um, like see my relationships differently. I really started to honor the relationships I had in my life. Um, but I'll tell you, it was, um, it was a, it was a gradual change in terms of coming out of landmark was like a, I was shot out of a cannon, but it faded, right? I got into regular life. Um, what they told me in the forum was like, look, you're transformed, but people are going to see you as who you were before. And it's going to be a cognitive dissonance. You're going to be talking all of this and, you know, tra you know, this, this new insight that you've learned. But as you talk to people, they're not going to necessarily, they're going to put you back into that square that they know you as. And that's going to eventually wear on what you've learned. And I said, no, no, no way. Well, that's what happened, right? So just a month or two months later, I started to kind of take on my old slowly way of being. And I found myself in a position where I needed, I felt that I needed to, um, to continue, like I needed more work, right? Like that was an insight. It was like a window had opened and I got a little insight, but I needed more. So I, um, I decided, okay, I'm going to go to Burning Man. I'd never been to Burning Man before. So I said, okay, I'm going to go to Burning Man. Um, because so you didn't Burning do level Man. two of land, the landmark form. You, you were like, now nah, just, okay. Not yeah. Yet. No, 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 not, right. I didn't, I didn't jump into it yet. What year I, is this I, again? Remind me of the year. 2015. 2015. Okay. No, no, no. Uh, early 2015. Okay. So, so yeah. So, so going through 2015, I, I, um, wait, no, no, I'm sorry. It was December, 2015. It was the end. It was going into 2016. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So my life changed, right? So I immediately decided that, okay, I'm not an entrepreneur. I'm not any of this. This is what I've made. I've labeled myself as this. I'm, I'm, a, you know, I have, I have potential beyond this. It's self-limiting to, you know, so I had all these different things that I'd sort of learned through Landmark and decided that I'm just going to say yes to whatever it is that, that, that happens in life. And so I was at a, I was at an auction um, I was, one of my clients was the discovery channel and every year in, in December they had an auction and like right coming out of the, the landmark, uh, forum, like the first event I had was this like Christmas silent auction. And I used to take, I used to uh, do theater in, in, in college and I stopped when I had my first daughter, but it was always something in the back of my mind, like, oh, you know, maybe, you know, it's fun. I loved it. I liked acting and all that. Well, there was a, there was a, um, there was a silent auction where I could, you know, the winner gets to audition. Uh, with the head of daytime for CBS, a guy by the name of Peter Golden, and I, you know, in my mind, I one of my labels was not an actor. Like that was something that you know I just didn't. You know, I had no business doing that, right? But for some reason, I said I got to say yes to this. So I, I bid on this silent, and I bid high and high, and at, at, I won. So suddenly, I have an audition with the head of casting for CBS, Peter Golden, coming up. It's on, it's in my, it's in my calendar and I haven't done any acting in, uh, a long time, probably, you know, 16 years. I, I so my voice in my head is you have no business, you know, doing this, you know, you, you, what, what do you know about, you know, going to Hollywood and to studio city and to, you know, audition? Well, to me, that was a, that was something that caused fear to a certain degree, but now I was embracing it. So I started to take acting classes. I started to do all of the, you know, I, 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 I did a lot. I actually went to a two week intensive at the New York Academy of Dramatic Arts where wow. I, um, had to do a, um, not just a, not just a dramatic monologue, but a dramatic monologue, a comedic monologue. And I had to actually sing. So, so part of it was they had, you know, I, I had to pick a, pick a song and then sing along with, you know, a guy playing the piano. I, I forgot what that's called now, but Whatever. So I had, to, I had to learn all that in like five months. And I did. And I went through with it. And I won't get into the whole, you know, you know, the, but I got a call back um, for Hawaii 5.0. Now I was back in DC, 
there look there's a I, I can I could go into a whole hour about what happened during that week when I was in Hollywood but but the point is that my belief cycle like was just really like firing off at that point I mean I I I felt comfortable I I went in front of like multiple I had seven auditions within like six days or four days or something like that and I was just used to just getting you know sitting in a chair in front of five people with a camera on me go and that didn't freak me out. And so that was sort of another sort of uh, step in my, um, almost my deconstructing of who I was, right? So that happened. And then I went to Burning Man that year. And then I took the second, the advanced course. And then I took the self-expression leadership course in Landmark, then became a Landmark coach. And I decided I want to be a Landmark leader. So I started to go through that avenue, the leader program, which is a very intense program. And I was doing all that while I decided I was going to, you know, sell my old business. So I sold my business and decided, you know, I'm going to launch another startup, launched another startup, um, sold my training school. So I was just, I just decided that, hey, the world is, is, is my oyster and I can do anything I want. And it was really exhilarating. So, I mean, yeah, that was. The, and it from still the, is. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it hasn't stopped. It hasn't still exi- <laughs> no. He's been doing hasn't. acid this entire time. No, I'm just kidding. He is not. <laughs> no, no, maybe. Um, maybe. Yeah. But, <laughs> but I mean, it's been. Um, it really has like taken my life and added just so much more texture and so much more. You know, it's just so much rich, richer now, right? Um, and. Uh, and and I and I didn't even know it existed. So it, the, so the interesting thing is, that as a founder, and as somebody who who you know had you know kids and all this other stuff, I mean, I I thought I knew everything. I mean, I you know I I thought I I had it all. I knew how to start a business. I I got how to raise kids. I'm single dad. All this stuff. And there's just so much more. And and that and that just really opened my eyes. And I realized that man, life is just a nonstop journey of learning. And um and that's what came through. So it was, um, and it still is. I mean, it really has enhanced every aspect of my life, starting with Landmark, moving into more focused sort of meditation and, and then culminating in psychedelics. So let's, let's get into that a little bit. What, what did ayahuasca teach you that Landmark didn't? What was sort of like the, the, not the cherry on top, but what was the evolution that ayahuasca brought you through that landmark? Um, not that landmark didn't do it. It just, yeah. Couldn't, it can't teach certain things that ayahuasca no. can. And what, what were those things? Well, I, the thing is ayahuasca is, it's so hard to, to put into words. You know, it's something that you have always known was there and it's a, it, it's a remembrance. It's like, ah, oh, yes. You know, we, we have this connection with, with nature, with life, with each other, um, with spirit, with God that kind of falls into the background. It's not even in the background to some people. It just, it's, it almost turns into something that's, you know, written in books or, you know, you read in a story and you don't really relate to as in terms of being part of the world that we live in. But what ayahuasca did was it just connected immediately me with um, not just my inner child and my inner self, but like the essence of life, um, the essence of um, how I am connected to everything and how everything is connected to me. And the thing is, when when you say that, you know, you know, I, I know, you know, you you probably well, you understand. I mean, you know, you, you're 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 you've been in this work, um, but we. But just the connection to to the spirit is just something that you just can't be taught unless you have that that medicine. And you know, everything about it is magic. Just how that medicine sort of got here to us in order for us to be able to consume it in itself is a miracle. Um, and when you consume it, you realize that um, plants in general. Um, have just provided so much to us as human beings. And this is just yet another um, extremely important and vital insight 
that human beings and and animals um, have access to, along with you know the sustainability that plants give us, the food, the nourishment, the vitamins, the minerals, the the you know feeding our 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 you know the animals that 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 some of us eat. You know, there's just so much the oxygen and I mean everything is just so vital. And so my connection to plants. Um, just, just became such a bond. Right. Um, so it, it really, it's just, it, it's similar in the sense that it's transformational. It's similar in the sense that it causes a shift in, in the way that you relate to yourself and others around you in the world, but it's just so much more profound. And it just really is something that is, is deep within us that allows you to sort of to, to bring forth. And there isn't a place in your life that isn't transformed through psychedelics, if you allow it to be, um, you know, whether it's your business, whether it's your relationship with your parents or your kids or your friends or yourself or your health or your body or, you know, food or addictions or all of that is so available to you because most of what I just described is some, is things that we take on as human beings in the world as we go through. And this is, and this medicine, you know, specifically ayahuasca and others, but specifically ayahuasca is just a calling for, you know, what the, the, the essence of life, the trueness of life. Um, so yeah, I, I hope I explained that well, but it, it is very difficult well, to explain. It, <laughs> it, it is the, the, the ineffability yeah. of psychedelics is consistent across the board. And, you know, what I'm hearing in this sort of distinction between landmark and ayahuasca is the depth of ayahuasca is much greater uh, it reaches into all aspects of your existence, whereas Landmark might be a little more focused on only personal development or maybe only business and the way you're relating mm. to the leadership team. I know, I know there's some stuff with family and other units. And also the, the teaching of spirit, right? That, right. Yeah. that, that uh, and I agree with you, it's what research has shown. It's what so many people experience. You know, we're, we're raised in a, in a culture that is very disconnected from the mystery. And so when we have that experience for the first time, like you said, it's like, it's like we struggle from collective amnesia or we struggle mm -hmm. with collective amnesia as a human species. And when we work with these medicines, it reminds us of this deep archaic sort of wellspring within us that gets opened up um, yeah. in relationship with these plants. Cause so often in everyday life, we're just like plants are something that are, that we objectify to some degree, which is what makes it so easy to, to kill nature. And when you work with something like ayahuasca, it reminds us that, you know, everything is sacred and that everything has a place and that we are not better than we are in relationship with uh, these, these various plants. That's exactly right. And even things like money, for example, you know, I look at money as energy, right? I look at everything as energy now, right? And, um, and and just that relatedness to looking at the money, the capital as as a form of energy, and and where does that energy best serve? Whatever it is that you you know maybe uh, you know focused on, aware of, or, or any of that, just that sort of small insight um, is you know just changes everything, right? Um, and something as powerful as ayahuasca is uh, is something that will absolutely. Uh, transform the way that you see life in general and, and everything in and around it. So, so you, yeah. we, we did one heart. This is early 2019. Yeah. Let's fast forward. It's mid 2021. I remember I'm staying at a mutual, I was staying at Nicole, Nicole's place in Venice. She yeah. was out of town for a couple of weeks. I remember you called me, it's May 2021. And you're like, Paul, What's this new program you got? I think we could do something. You you had mentioned Landmark at that point in time in terms of mm -hmm. what's growing and evolving. As a lot of the listeners know, our focus is not on the medical and therapeutic use of psychedelics. Our focus is on optimization, on leadership, on performance, on awareness, on growth. What called to you about the the training program? Why is it that you felt like this was this this was something that you didn't just want to work with personally, but you, you felt like there was a, a greater potential here as a coach, as a, you know, someone who, who is professionally involved in, in the space. Yeah. So it, it seemed like the next step in, in how my 
professional and personal life were both evolving. So um, I had, you know, throughout my professional career, even prior to Landmark, I had taken on what I thought was coaching. It was really mentoring where people looking to, so I, I, my company's always been in the staffing and recruiting industry and training. So people looking to get into that industry um, and I was really involved in the different organizations, the associations, they would, they would contact me and I would offer services as a mentor. And I called myself a coach, but really it was more a mentor. Right. Um, and so after landmark and sort of things that evolved, I had really no interest in showing people the industry that I was in or how to properly manage the business. Right. I started to see that, ah, well, I had done some coaching, you know, transformational coaching with landmark. Now I saw psychedelics as being such a massive impact in life and such an amazing tool that those could use. So um, I signed up as part of the, um, uh, it, for, from one heart on some of the other journeys I went on, I, it was an integration uh, leader is what they called it. And it was effectively someone to help on the pre end of the journey, you know, work with people, understand what their intentions were, refine those intentions. And then uh, during the journey, during the actual retreat, be with them, hold some programming sessions, things like that, connect, right? And I found so much resonance around being an integration leader in, in the ceremonial space. And it was very related to what the work I was doing previously in Landmark. Um, and so I said, you know, what's missing, I feel, is the integration program that, that, that One Heart had. It was a five-week program. It was three weeks prior to ceremony, five weeks after ceremony. It's very it, mainly group group oriented and, um, and the relationships and the people that I was working with and, and how I was seeing the trajectory of, of how things were going after ceremony, um, inspired me to want to do more coaching in this space. And I really didn't know, you know, where this would fit. Right. I said, well, do I, do I want to do coaching on the integration side? Do I want to do, do I want to, you know, do I want to somehow bring psychedelics into the business world? Like, what does all that look like? Um, and then I saw that there was this program, I think Tim had mentioned it or something. So I said, you know, and, and, and so I, I called you and I'm like, wow, this is exactly what I wanted to do. You have like nailed it. Like, you know, there's a coaching program and there's now an ecosystem being, you know, cultivated of actual coaches and business leaders and people like that, that are, have now found psychedelics and want to make a difference in their coaching pre or therapeutic practices or what have you. That's ideal. That's what I'm looking for. So I signed up. And, um, and, you know, since I took, you know, I was, I was in the first cohort and, and since I, you know, you know, took the course, made these incredible connections with, um, psychologists and, uh, you know, facilitators and ecologists and, you know, you name it, there's all sorts of different folks in this program. Yeah. I started to see more and more that, Hey, um, this is something that's really starting to take hold. Like, you know, psychedelics, the evolution and, and the proliferation of this work, you know, it's almost doubling your, I mean, I, I don't know the exact stats. I'm sure you do, but um, it just feels like the momentum is just, you know, out of control. And so um, I started to, I, I made a decision after your course that I, I what I want to do is I want to make this my work that I do. And I'm not sure exactly where my particular skill set could, you know, apply as well, but I want to, I want to do that. And so I, I was, I was already, you know, mentoring. It's kind of cut off my executive coaching. I, I still, I, I transform, transform my mentoring into more transformational coaching. I started to kind of take the focus away from the business questions they had and broaden them a bit because every, every, everything that's going on with your business in some way is affected by something, you know, that's a lot deeper than that. And so my coaching became a little bit more resonant, more authentic to the folks that I was working with. And then I started to bring in the psychedelic component first at first thinking, you know, they're not, you know, it's, it's a possibility, but you know, is, are they going to really be interested? And one of my members of my board, who's probably one of the most conservative guys I've ever worked with, he, um, was diagnosed with, with colon cancer. Um, and, uh, and it completely changed his life. And, uh, and him and I were working, you know, closely together. And, um, and I, I told him a little bit about my work around psychedelics. I hadn't really shared too much of it, but at this point I was so involved, I had to share. Right. So my inauthentic way of being became extremely authentic. I stopped telling people I was going to meditation retreats. I explained to people that I'm in this work 
And what I realized was that people were genuinely curious. And he came to me and he said, Hey, I'm, you know, this is something I'm, I might be interested in. I'm not sure because I have to run it through my doctor and I don't want to, you know, you know, there's, there's chemo and there's all of this, but I'm interested. So I had the conversation with him and, um, he never went on a retreat. He was open to it, but just four, four months ago, he started microdosing. Um, and this is somebody that I would have never thought would micro. I mean, this is someone who's never, you know, smoked a joint in his life. I mean, this is somebody who's like as clean as clean gets. Um, and he started microdosing and he found so many benefits from, from the microdosing and it's, it's, it started to transform his life. So then I, I realized, you know, I have this, you know, I have this, 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 um, skill set. I have these, these groups of people who haven't been touched by this work. I want to make this my, you know, I want to make this my life's work. And so that's what's happened, you know? And so most recently I just wrapped up a, uh, I, I went back to my alma mater, George Mason university. And I, um, took an organizational well-being course. That's an ICF certif certification course. And, um, I was the only one there who had any experience at all with psychedelics, much less psychedelic facilitation or any of that. Wow. These, this, this, for those that don't know, George Mason is a university in Northern Virginia. It's outside of DC. And, um, 90% of the people in that class were with the, with some government organization, some acronym, you know, wow. DOJ, you know, HUD, whatever they are. Right. Um, and, uh, but, but I got so many people curious about psychedelics there. Right. And even one person is going to be going on the sacred path journey with Andy from our CCP, because when I, y y y you know, another thing's interesting here, Paul, when I, when I have this discussion, I realize that some people just, you know, prefer certain methods or modalities or paths when they, when they go down this, this path. And so he had, he, he, he really felt that the path of nature and walking through nature with an ecologist, that's what he wanted to do. So I said, Hey, I know somebody who does that. And I pointed in that direction. <laughs> so, um, and that's a guy named Andy Sudbrock, who was part of our, our, um, our cohort one. So anyway, my point is that I found that this work resonates with not just you know, the folks in this, you know, in this work. And a lot of the times in the spiritual community, there's a lot of, there's, there's a bit of a dogma that showed up to a certain degree. Um, but this work resonates to people all over government workers, you name it. It's interesting. Cause I was chatting with someone earlier today, um, on a zoom, I'll be on her podcast. It's like a leadership podcast a little bit later on. And we were talking about how you know she mentioned someone that she knew who was a senior level government official for both the Clinton administration and also the Obama administration who has done over 30 psilocybin journeys uh, wow. at this point in time and that you know if we had if we had been having this conversation 6 years ago that would be oh my gosh that's incredible i can't believe that and now that we're having it in 2023 it's like kind of expected okay. you know yeah. like when i feel like when we show up in situations and places that you know like i love to be the psychedelic guy at a, at a non-psychedelic event or conference because it yeah. tends to be especially nowadays a topic of curiosity and interest especially for those who don't know a lot about it and um i'd much rather talk with people across the table than who already get it to some degree, right? Because I feel like the more we can expand the bubble, right? The, the, the more people can actually find true healing and transformation. Because as you and I both know, there's a lot of stuff in therapy. There's a lot of stuff in personal development. There's a lot of stuff in sort of the new age community that people claim works, because maybe for that person it worked or for that, that group of people it worked. But what we find with psychedelics again and again is that if certain parameters are paid attention to, have a coach, have a guide, have a facilitator, do preparation, do integration, work with the right medicine, then time and time again, people have incredibly transformative experiences. And I think the key, and this is what I want to get your thoughts on next, because I, I sense you'll have some insight into this. The key is, of course, integration and stabilizing at that mm -hmm. sort of new lens or that new perspective. So I'm curious from, from your perspective, I know you're working on a number of things and you don't have to disclose specifically what those are here, but mm -hmm. 
But I'd just be curious, like, what are you doing on an active basis to, um, to build a new paradigm or a new build new systems that allow people to be authentic, that allow people mm-hmm. to show up as their best selves, that allow people to, um, you know, stabilize at these new ways and new beings and, and new perspectives. Because like you mentioned with Landmark, we have these breakthroughs, we have these insights. And then a month or two later, a lot of that goes away. And this can also be true for psychedelics. So I'm curious, just like, because you're an entrepreneur at the end of the day, you're mm-hmm. a creator, you, you, are at, you are still an entrepreneur. What, what does that look like in terms of in your worldview and your, in sort of like, what are you actively creating? Yeah. <clears throat> well, um, I have the, you know, as being an entrepreneur um, and being someone who is actively running a, you know, functioning company right now, startup with 23 employees, I get to use what I'm learning in a real scenario where you have human beings collaborating and working with each other and creating and all of that. So what, you know, the the first thing that I do is in terms of my existing non-psychedelic sort of life, because I still do, you know, run a startup that is not in the psychedelic world. It's in the HR uh, software world. Um, I've just completely transformed my company in terms of having it be highly collaborative. So another person, uh, Keith Ferrazzi, um, who's part of our, um, who's part of our journey as well. He wrote a book called, um, leadership without authority. And I started to really look at leadership without it. What does that look like? Cause even that term initially, had I not heard that before meeting Keith or being in this work, I said, how do you lead without authority? How do you do that? Well, I realized that it's, it's actually something that is, um, in the in the world, especially startups or small businesses that really have to be nimble and have to be able to be aware of what's happening in a given marketplace or be really highly collaborative and highly functional in that way, then having an authority or a hierarchical type of way of, of leading a business or an organization just doesn't work. I mean, it really is open communication and collaboration, but it's not just buzzwords, right? It's not just, hey, you know, because there's a million buzzwords around that, right? But is actually setting up an organization that is able to collaborate from within, to pivot quickly. But the most important thing in that, uh, Paul, is that people enjoy what they're doing. They enjoy the work. They enjoy working with each other. Like the element of joy and harmony is so critical in wherever you are, right? And so my um, my my sort of uh, uh, like way of talking to those who say work-life balance and all this. I say, well, hold on. When you're at work and when you're in life, you're still in life. In other words, when you're at work, you're, you have life. When you're at the gym, you're in life. When you're a parent, you're in life. It's all life, no matter what. So it's just balance in general. And so what we need more in life is balance, joy, fun, collaboration, learning, and all of that. So I've just taken that and I've as much as I possibly can have infused that into the culture of my business. And then Everything in my life at this point, Paul, is somehow involved in the transformational space, whether it's my company, whether it's uh, other projects I'm involved in. Um, my my focus now is to really work with those, meet people where they're at that haven't found this work. And whether it's psychedelics, whether it's breath work, whether it's programs like Landmark, really just give as much access to that insight uh, as I possibly can. And I think what's important is allow for the space for those that, that, that want to grow or that, uh, um, that see this as being something that, um, could be transformational, impactful in their lives, allow that space for that to show up. Um, and that's what sort of my life, that, that, that's what my, my life is moving towards. And, um, and it's, it's really, it's, it's, it's something that, uh, has given like true purpose to, to what I do, uh, all around. And I see, I was checking out your website before we started today. You know, you have up there Psychedelic Coach. Uh, You've really started to, I think, integrate this. I I sense with your background as an entrepreneur and and the companies that you've run and and what you've created and built, you know, you will continue to act as a really great bridge uh, for those who are coming into the space. Um, So I'd be curious, like, as we wrap up, what, you know, when you look at the next year ahead, so it's, and you know, just imagine it's the end of 2023. What's maybe one thing you've done or, or accomplished or created 
that you're really jazzed and excited for? Yeah. Well, there's that's a lot. I think what I'm really jazzed and excited for right now. You can now, only pick one thing, though. Oh, shit. Okay. One thing. Um, <laughs> What's the one thing? All right. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to impact the community that I – am grew up in, which is the Washington DC transactional okay. political community. So I want to bring this work to that population, to that community, to potentially the government, to potentially those that don't necessarily have access to this as much as I can. I want to do that. And so I'm involved with um, something called the Shenandoah nature retreat, which is opening in 2025. It's a five-star resort. Hmm. Um, some folks who are start, uh, C-suite, former C-suite of one of the largest hotel organizations in the world are getting behind it. It is, mm. uh, it's not a plant medicine retreat, but it's plant medicine friendly, which I think is going to be the in, sort of the inroads to being able to bring people who aren't in this work into this work. So I think that's one of the, that's probably one of the most uh, exciting things that I have going on. Um, and then we have some sound healing things. There's a lot, but we'll stick with that one for now because each thing that I'm working on could be a full episode. So <laughs> we'll, we'll leave it there. So, so the Shenandoah nature retreat, going back yep. into the sort of DC political community, yep. making an impact that way. Yeah. Um, I know, I know you're working on the sound retreat. Do you want to talk at all about that? Tell, yeah. tell the audience a little bit about it. Well, it's yeah, fucking, sure. So it's cool. That, if you want, it's very cool. So one of the things, so like real quickly, going into the um, to the One Heart Retreat that we met at, um, the music that resonated with me at the time, I liked jazz, I liked some rock, I loved hip hop, I loved sort of the EDM scene, I loved all of that, right? And Barry, who is the, you know, who was the person who showed me One Heart, it, before ceremony said, you know, wake up to find out that you are the eyes of the world. And I was like, what the hell is that? That sounds really cool. What is that? So I went and talked to Barry. He goes, "Hey, that's the Grateful Dead." And and you know, there's a lot. You know, I I wasn't I didn't know anything about the Grateful Dead at all. Knew nothing about them. Um, I knew I, I'd heard of wow. them and I'd heard a couple songs. And but I wasn't a Deadhead. I'd been to a Dead show to sell nitrous. That's a different story. In '92 when they were at <laughs> RFK, <laughs> but I wasn't actually. I didn't understand the community and I didn't understand the transformational nature of of the Dead. I didn't understand how the dead and their music and that community related to the work. And slowly I started to pull back this rope since my retreat. I, wa I, I went to my tent uh, at, at, you know, during the retreat. I turned on Pandora. I played some dead songs and I haven't stopped playing them since. So, so now I'm working with uh, a, a group of people also from the CCP, from the, uh, the, the training program cohort one. And we're putting together a grateful dead based ceremony. So it's transformational work. It is a ceremony, a true plant medicine ceremony. And it is sort of, it's, it's the container is provided by the community and the heart and the soul that was initiated through the grateful dead. And if, and if those, those of you, again, we can have a whole another show about that, but the grateful dead themselves were a big part of the second wave, Timothy Leary's I, you know, what we know is acid and what we know is psychedelics. The Grateful Dead had a big part of that. As a matter of fact, if nowadays I'd say that they were probably the shamans of acid to the West um, during the second wave. And I think they have a lot to do with why we're here as well. So, uh, but I didn't know anything about that. And so now I'm working on that with some very talented people. Some of the founders of Blue Man Group are part of that. Um, we have, um, you know, we have, uh, you know, one of the executive coach and we have lots of cool people being involved. So, that's to come soon, but that's another very cool project I'm involved in. So thanks for asking. I'm glad you brought up the Grateful Dead. The first ever podcast we did for this podcast was with a guy named Jesse Jarnow who wrote a book <laughs> called Heads. Yeah, he's awesome. Which is a like a, yeah. a massive book about the Grateful Dead and how they really tied together um, the like 70s, 80s, 90s. So prohibition went into play 60s, 70s, and the yeah. Grateful Dead is what kept it alive yeah, totally. for that entire, and, and Terrence McKenna That's for right. that entire period until the new research came out and you know all those sorts of things. So they've been a huge sort of spider web for the psychedelic movement um, from the second wave to the third wave. So yeah, yeah. and I, I, I've been to a fish show. I've listened to the Grateful Dead a little bit. I would not say jam bands are my favorite, but I'm also open to uh i've never 
going to a dead show. I don't, are they still playing? I know they're no. John, they were doing John Jerry, Mayer and dead. Yeah. Jerry, no, Jerry's obviously the heart and soul and he's Jerry gone, died but, yeah, in 94, 95. Yeah. 27 but, years ago. Yeah. Yeah. But no, John Mayer's with them. Dead and company's final tours this year. Like I love, that's what to I jump thought. On. Okay. As this is it. Yeah. This is I it. definitely need to go then. I definitely need yeah. to go to an, to a show for yeah, sure. Let, let's yeah, go. Okay. Man. We're going to a show. We're going to a show All this right. year. Um, just like you, right. I wasn't a jam band guy either, but you know, the, the Grateful Dead, they the one thing about them is they didn't plan sets. They didn't they they played in a very gestalt way. And what was essential to them was the community that they were feeding energy back and forth. So each dead show was truly a ceremony. And and um and I'm excited to share that with you, brother, in our in our in our dead and company uh Final Let's pick a date. My my date, my year is quite open. I have gorge. a sabbatical. So once the gorge once in Washington State, three nights. We'll go camping. Okay. Let's do it. All right. You just right. okay. This is recorded, so we're going to the dead <laughs> in Washington. I'm on it. All right, I'm good. on it. Beautiful. Amazing. I'm just brother. gonna look at the dates, and you know, I have a couple commitments. One in June, but that's it. This is July, so, so you're free. Perfect. Yeah, July is perfectly open. <laughs> beautiful all right I well we'll wrap it up with that alex atwood if people want to find out more about you your background you have a pretty active linkedin yeah. uh what's your website my website's alexatwood.co not.com so feel free to co yep okay co a l e x a one t w o o d you're right i am active on linkedin i uh never really got too active on instagram or the other ones but linkedin because i'm a founder and because i just have so so much of my world was business I've been putting a lot of content on LinkedIn. So check me out there. You can just search me. You can Google my name, Alex Atwood. A lot of the stuff I'm working on will be coming up. I also have a podcast called The Alchemist Lounge. You'll enjoy that. Paul was on The Alchemist Lounge. We have lots of really interesting guests on there. So please check it out. You can also Google The Alchemist Lounge. You can find it anywhere where uh, podcasts are streamed. Um, and yeah, feel free to reach out anytime. I'm, I love talking about this work. Thank you, Alex. This was fun. Yeah, Ton absolutely, fun. brother. Thanks so much for watching. If you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics, subscribe to this channel and visit thethirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelic use.